Good day, I'm Dr. T and welcome to my office. So today I'd like to talk about error. Uh, when I talk about error, actually there's two types of error that I typically refer to. That in uh, an error in our understanding or in our interpretation of data, and then error in data itself. And that latter category, uh, just simply measurements that are not totally true, uh, I will deal with in a later video. Uh, but the point I do want to make first, uh, before discussing either of the types of error, is that we are mortal. We are humans, we are imperfect, and everything that we do will be inherently imperfect. And thus, we always must take into account that our measurements will not be perfect, and our interpretations of our data will not be perfect as well. And thus, take steps accordingly to realize that we're not perfect. Now, the first, let's talk about the uh, mistakes in our interpretation of data. Uh, there's basically two ways you can go with this. Uh, you could make a mistake in believing something that is not true. Um, we would be accepting a hypothesis when it is not actually the case, or we could say this is a false positive. The classic example I like to give is you're walking through a jungle in Southeast Asia, you see a big tuft of grass, the grass moves, and so you ask yourself, hmm, I wonder why the grass is moving. I'm in Southeast Asia. There are tigers in Southeast Asia, at least in this area of Southeast Asia. Oh no, run, panic, and run away. But there is no tiger. It was just the wind rustling the grass. Alternatively, of course, you could uh, reject a true hypothesis, or you could have a false negative. In this case, the same scenario. You're walking through the jungle and you see a giant tuft of grass and it's rustling and you're going, oh no, I'm in Southeast Asia in a region that happens to have tigers. Eh, it's probably nothing. <laughs> and you're eaten by a cat. Well, as humans, we're actually predisposed to make the first one because let's just be honest, given the choice of looking like an idiot or becoming tiger food, I think we'll all decide to choose to look like the idiot. Uh, however, for a society, while the false positive is somewhat safer for an individual, the society, it's not safer uh, because false positives can build on one another. Uh, we can look at the classic case of alchemy and the search for the philosopher's stone. There's no philosopher's stone. This is false positives on false positives on downright lies. Uh, so yeah, we can waste a lot of time. Or we could you know, trust in some kind of pharmaceutical that we think will make ourselves better, but in reality, poisons ourselves. Um, the search for eternal life uh, has been fraught with magic potions and elixirs that don't bring eternal life. They bring a slightly shorter temporal existence uh, because we believe something and it wasn't true. Uh, so, as scientists, what we want to do is we actually want to bias ourselves towards making type 2 errors, the false negatives, as opposed to the aforementioned type 1 errors, the false positives. Now, this is going to limit things. This is going to mean that science is going to be somewhat slow. Uh, we are going to make mistakes, and those mistakes will hold us back but we aren't going to be going down blind alleys and doing crazy stuff that um, you know, we could be doing otherwise if we believed things that you know, weren't true. Uh, of course, we are still mortal, we still make mistakes, and we still make type 1 errors. But let's look at briefly how we biased ourselves to making the type 2 errors, which for a society are preferable. Uh, the first approach uh, we're going to be taking is, of course, just setting the stage. We're going to have our understanding of the way the world works, what I typically call the model. From that, we're going to be developing an if-then statement. If I understand the model correctly, then I should see this happen. This is what we refer to as a hypothesis. In order to bias towards type 2 errors, one of the tricks we're going to do is we're going to ensure that any experiment that I do, I can disprove the hypothesis. So if I have an experiment where I want to see if there's any ninjas in my house that are super good at hiding, I'm going to have to be very careful on setting up that experiment or even making that hypothesis because I can't necessarily disprove that there's not a ninja hiding somewhere in my house. 
Because, you know, they're ninjas and they're hard to find. That's kind of their whole gig. So I'm actually going to have to avoid certain questions, questions where I can't disprove the hypothesis. Or I should say where my null hypothesis, the, the if then, if I'm wrong part of the if then statement, uh, can't be readily distinguished from my actual hypothesis. So if my hypothesis is they're undetectable ninjas and I will find that out by not finding ninjas, that's indistinguishable from they're not actually being ninjas. So I'm just going to have to avoid some of those questions. And therefore, there will be questions that as scientists, we just have to go, sorry, we can't answer that question, which is definitely frustrating uh, because these are sometimes very important questions. What's the meaning of life? What happens after you're dead? Um, yeah, these are not properties of science. These are properties of the humanities, the arts and th uh, theology and philosophy. But as a scientist, we can't use a scientific method because it can't ask those questions, mostly because those hypotheses would be unfalsifiable. Inherent in each hypothesis is it must be falsifiable. I must be able to perform an experiment to prove it wrong. The next step is to do an experiment and do my level best to prove myself wrong. And by doing so, I've then, you know, tested it. If I prove it wrong, then I go back and I rework my model. I have changed my understanding of how the world works. If, however, uh, I don't prove it wrong, then great, my model stands. Um, I haven't actually proved it right, because I can never actually prove it right, because fundamentally I never know if I failed to disprove my hypothesis because it is correct, or because I simply failed to disprove my hypothesis my experiment wasn't good enough. Now, after a while, hypotheses keep not getting disproved, and you can pretty much take it to the bank that it's basically right. But you can never actually prove anything, which is definitely frustrating for most folks. Uh, but yeah, at this point, hey, I've got my uh, model. It seems to be holding out well, and if I need to change it, I'll change it later. But after a series of experimentations, I've got my understanding. I'm going to build on this. Now, once again, I might have to change everything later, but hopefully it's good to go. So with that said, I'll see you next time and have a wonderful day.